Hello everyone, welcome to our monthly InfoSec seminar organized by the Information System Security and Assurance Management Department in Mihalshan School of Management. Today, we are pleased to have Michael Spalling to give us an interesting talk about what not to put in your resume. Michael leads a team of professionals involved in various information security work for the University of Alberta. He has presented on various security topics at conferences and events, including ISACA, Can Hide, Edmonton Expo, besides Calgary, besides Edmonton, and besides Las Vegas. He has a handful of published CVEs to his credit and numerous vulnerability disclosures to various organizations. Thanks, Michael, for being with us today and sharing your experience with us. And for our guests from outside Concordia without Concordia email address, Please register on this link to receive your attendance uh, certificate. I will share it with you on the chatting box. All yours now, Michael. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Aslam, for the introduction. And uh, again, thank you, everybody, for attending this uh, this talk today. Um, I know Dr. Sergey Budakov is, is not able to attend. I believe he's uh, traveling. So I also just want to say uh, thank you to him. Um, him and I, we've known each other for many years, and we uh, we finally uh, after you know two and a half years of COVID, we're able to, to see each other in person again um, at a conference in Banff back in November. And uh, we just sat next to each other for a bit, and he told me about the speaker series and asked if I'd be willing to speak on 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 a topic. And I asked him, uh, you know, is there anything that you know students or, or the general public wants to learn about? And he said, whatever you want to talk about. So I said, okay, I've got I got I got a topic. I've had this one in my head for some time. Um, I just need to put it on paper, and I'd love to do it. Um, and I gave him just uh, some of the examples of some of the stuff that, that I wanted to talk about regarding uh, things that I see on cybersecurity resumes when people apply to uh, uh, roles that I'm hiring for. Uh, and and you know the idea was kind of some, some of the more humorous stuff that, that I do see, but it's also quite common. And he uh, he was like, yeah, you, you should do that. That would make a great talk. So that's that's kind of how we got here. So um, I know you uh, you did an introduction, Eslam. Um, just a couple of things I'll add to it. So again, yeah, team lead. Uh, I lead the information security team at the University of Alberta. So to expand on that a little bit, um, what that means is um, we have a nine-person uh, portfolio uh, responsible for all of the information security um, at the U of A. So uh, I lead um, five of those people report directly to me, and we're responsible for more of the technical side of cybersecurity. So things like firewalls, VPNs, anti-malware systems, uh, vulnerability management, security incident response. Uh, we're often involved in like education, consulting, awareness. Um, all, all of that stuff reports directly to me. So that's my full-time job. Um, I am also an instructor at the U of A as well. So we have a program called MINT. Uh, it stands for Masters of Science in Internetworking. So it takes students from uh, the computer and or the electrical and computer engineering discipline, the computing science discipline, throws them together and teaches them large-scale global um, IP communication networks like the public internet. So within that program, um, I teach a course called Advanced Network Security, which is all about you know, the security of data as, as it moves um, uh, between different different endpoints. Um, and then finally, as a uh, requirement to graduate from that program, I think uh, the Concordia students will probably be able to, you're know, probably familiar with this thing. Same one is that you have to do a capstone research project. So what that involves is uh, the students have to identify sort of something that they want, they want to research, um, identify problems, um, propose solutions. Um, oftentimes they're encouraged to have like a lab or a, um, a practical component to it. Uh, that's um, That takes about six, seven or eight months, depending on, on how much uh, time and effort they want to put into it. The end result is usually about a 100 page PDF um, that, that gets published and congratulations, you graduate. So one of the requirements to enroll in that program um, is you have to seek out a subject matter expert uh, in the area that, that you want to study in order to sort of supervise you. So um, I play that role as well uh, for some of the cybersecurity uh, proposals that come forward. So I'm actually doing one of those right now which is fun. And then um, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of changes and additions to post-secondaries uh, when it comes to like adding cybersecurity programs and curriculum, which is great. So uh, I co-chair the, um, the uh, what is it, the Cybersecurity Post-Diploma um, Advisory Committee for uh, NATE. Um, I also sit on uh, some of their other advisory committees and some from some institutions down in Calgary. So a lot of my, my professional efforts with security are, are tied mostly to post-secondary, um, be it the day-to-day -day operations of a large institution and uh, a little bit of the, the academic and teaching side. So um, as part of this, uh, I spend a lot of time with people and talking to students, teaching students, um, teaching professionals, talking to professionals. and 
you know, the job market, as as uh, I think Sean had mentioned, you know, you guys have had a lot of presentations already on the job market. So I'm gonna I'm gonna add to that a little bit. Before we get going, I just have a couple things that I want to bring up. First and foremost, so these are my experiences. Okay, um, the nature of resume writing and cover letters and all of that is you can talk to five different people and probably get five completely different pieces of advice of how to do it. So everything you're going to talk about today, these are just my experiences applying for jobs on my team. So not, you know, University of Alberta wide experiences, just mine. So you you don't have to take this advice. Um, you may or may not, your mileage may vary. Number two, I'm only using real world examples. Okay. So this is stuff that I've actually seen on resumes coming, you know, for legitimate applications for jobs. Um, these aren't things that are, you know, lifted from websites or just hypothetical scenarios. This is stuff that people have actually written down and submitted. Um, again, everything is anonymized. So one thing I do, I do just want to say real quick, um, there are some things that I've rewritten a little bit. The spirit of what was said is still there, but I've rewritten them just because I don't want people to, you know, take that verbatim, run it through their their employment systems, and see, oh, maybe that person was in here and, and see who they were. Uh, and last thing, no, there's absolutely no offense meant. Okay, so part of this presentation, it is meant to be a little, a little humorous, you know, a little like, what, what, huh? You know, it's it's okay, but we're not. The goal is not to make fun of people or or you know mock or anything. It, it is to to have a serious presentation where we can actually pull out things and say, hey, probably shouldn't be doing this. And the last one. Um, every now and then, you know, why not tell us what we should be doing? And the answer is, I get this regularly, right? Speaking to students, speaking to professionals, you know, people who want to get into the security industry, they say, "What, well, Michael, what should I do? What should I put on my resume? What should I do that makes me stand out? And while I do have answers to that, um, I will admit, I don't think there's much consensus with resume standards, right? As I said earlier, a lot of people can tell you what to do and you'll hear completely different things. Number two, you are at the mercy of the organization's hiring processes. So there might be things that, that one organization is looking for that another organization isn't. One might be following a certain type of process, another may not. Some might be using computers to look for, for keywords and, and others might have human beings. Um, for me, I see every single resume that comes down the pipe for an application on my team. Um, I don't pre-filter it. I don't have any computers or, or HR or anything, you know, telling me who I should interview. If you apply for a job on my team, I've, I see the resume. And to this point, I've seen probably a thousand of them. And there's plenty of resources already available uh, for what to do. But I don't often find a lot of stuff around what not to do. So that's the introduction. Let's get going here. Um, this very first one, it might seem completely obvious, but I have a stat that I'll throw out, throw out in a slide or two that, that will tell you this. But number one, don't skip required documentation when submitting your application. Um, again, that, that might seem obvious, but the sheer volume of applications I get where people are not submitting all of the required documents usually means that that application doesn't even get considered. I might not even look at it. The very first thing that I do when I open up you know, kind of the application package is I scroll through it to see is all the required documentation that I need submitted. And if it isn't, there's a good chance oh, you might just, just you know, throw it into another pile or you hit delete or something. Um, some organizations actually require things like portfolios of work. Uh, you know, if it's outside of cybersecurity, if it's, you know, more of an artistic job, they might want samples of your work, right? If it's um, like a web design job, they might want to see a portfolio of sites you've created. Uh, so if you're just submitting just a resume uh, that doesn't include any of that, um, they might not, you know, consider it further. So I'll use the U of A as an example. So we require four things. And again, like this isn't some ridiculous thing. We require four things. Uh, we require a cover letter, a resume as a single document, and you know PDF, RTF, DocX, yeah, I think text, you know, whatever. Um, and some groups actually require five. Like if you see a posting from our faculty of engineering, um, it will say explicitly, you also have to submit a document um, that's a write-up where you have to explain how you will contribute to a culture of success in the faculty of engineering. And then it will say right there, um, if you don't submit that fifth requirement, your application will not be considered for review. So the first step here is is make sure you review what is actually required um, when submitting documents. So at the U of A, if I work bottom up, file types, PDF, RTF, DocX, yeah, that's everyone does that. Like I've never seen a JPEG resume. I've never seen you know a, an MP4 or something. You know, so that's not an issue. Um, single document, same thing. You know, it's just here's my here's my document. You know, I've never seen anybody apply twice or three times with a different document in each application. Um, resume, that's a given. 
Um, however, that number one cover letter, here's my crazy stat, 47%, I track this just for that, 47% of applications that I get on my team do not have a cover letter assigned to it. So almost half of the apps that I get are missing cover letters. Now, I know there's a lot of stuff out there that says don't use cover letters, cover letters are lame, you know, they're, they're old, you don't have to have a cover letter. And well, there may be some truth to that. Um, we as an organization require it. We need a cover letter. And if you don't submit it, it's considered an incomplete application. I'm not obligated in any way to, to even move that, 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 that application forward. So if someone spends all this time getting the most brilliant, shiny, polished resume, hit submit, and they don't have a cover letter with it, um, that's probably a lot of wasted time. And this, this stat constantly shocks me, um, almost half. So by way of just having like created a cover letter, you you you're in that 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 already that that top um, uh, majority of people that that are are you know I'm gonna look at that and I'm gonna say oh there's a cover letter okay I'll come back to this later so that's the most important thing so far is just just make sure you submit the documentation also for me um, I use it as a uh, uh, what's the word um, you know can you follow instructions that that's really it you know the most simple basic thing can you follow the instructions on the website right um, I'm, you know, at some point, yes, we're going to start evaluating skill sets. We're going to start evaluating personality, all that stuff. But step one, the most important thing is, is the person capable of following basic instructions on a website to get a job? And if the answer to that is you didn't submit a cover letter, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to start questioning that. So, so that's, that's it. Number two, this is one of my favorites. Don't use, um, uh, unclear doesn't sound grammatically correct, but I used it anyways. Don't use unclear wording when highlighting your skills or abilities. Um, I'm just going to jump to these examples here, right? Words like uh, you want to use words like, like let's say, ex expert or expertise in or proficient in, um, or or you know something like that. Words that are universal. These are things that I have actually seen on resumes submitted to me. Um, some of my favorites. Uh, I am a Jedi in networking. I am a messiah in system administration. I am the Mozart of cybersecurity. Now, I get it. Like I read that, I get what they're saying. You know, there's, there's, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna make this a discussion about, you know, being egotistical or anything like that. But I get what they're saying. They're trying to say, you know, I have, you know, some degree of of expertise and knowledge in this industry. But the catch is that not a lot of like these are not common language. Um, the one example I have, uh, we have uh, an HR lady. Well, we used to. She, she left recently. Um, I still talk to her regularly. But uh, she's HR for the department that I work in, which is all like IT people and nerdy, nerdy computer people. And and we always teased her because uh, she's never seen Star Wars, you know. And and it's basically a rite of passage to to have seen Star Wars, you know, to work in our our our, our nerdy IT department. So she doesn't know what a Jedi is. So if she's looking through these resumes and she says, you know, I'm a Jedi in networking, uh, she'll go to Google and she's going to search Jedi. Like, what is that? And she's going to see, you know, these pictures of aliens with cloaks and, you know, swinging laser swords around. And, and like, that might be cool if you're applying for a Star Wars convention or something. But for a professional role in a cybersecurity team at the U of A, you know, there, 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 is, there is a degree of professionalism that we are looking for. And uh, people are going to see that and they're going to be like, no, like, that, that's like, that's cosplay. Like, Maybe on Halloween or something, but the point is, you know, I'm a Jedi in networking. Just replace that with, you know, I'm I have you know expertise in networking or something. Um, same with Messiah. This one, I, I don't want to turn this into a, a religious debate or anything, but it's usually, in my opinion, it's probably not the best idea to to you know equate your skill sets to like religious deities. You know, you might you might just risk you know offending or upsetting perhaps you know the wrong person who who may not like that that comparison. So again, just keep it out of there. Um, I'm the Mozart of cybersecurity. That was that was a little uh, more recent, but you know, same thing. Nothing against Mozart or anything like that. But at the same time, like just in, in that specific case, it was from somebody who um, didn't actually have a lot, if any, of any like formal hands-on experience with with really anything. So for that situation, I was looking at kind of this going like you know why. That's where you know maybe some arrogance starts. Like I, I can see that through the resume of someone who has no actual hands-on experience with cybersecurity. Um, you know, hasn't even gone to school, hasn't hasn't done anything with it. But they're telling me they're the Mozart of it. Um, I'm gonna start looking at it and being like, okay, you know, there's there's a few flags there. Um, so that's that's the other one, right? Is just 
you know, don't don't use uncommon language, uh, especially things like pop culture references or religious deities or something. I've seen these in resumes, and it 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 sticks out in, in a bad way. Um, on that same topic, here's the next one. Uh, it's okay to sell yourself. Like that's that's the point of a resume. That's what you're trying to do, right? But don't exaggerate or embellish. Okay, um, it's very easy to tell when someone is using language um, where they haven't paid much attention to um, maybe who else is applying for the job, or or I can tell when someone says I have large. One of my one of my favorites was somebody said I have um, experience with they said like large enterprise networks including some with over or they said up to 200 users and that was fascinating because i look at that and i go 200 users in my opinion that's not a large enterprise network that's like not even our department right a large enterprise network would be maybe the u of a we have you know uh, what do we have 300,000 users uh, and, and about that right so it's okay to to sell yourself but don't exaggerate and embellish but i have one one example that i did see on a resume um, one of the things that, just to address perhaps an elephant in the room, uh, when you're a student and you're all taking the same courses and you're all taking the same classes and you're all set to graduate together, uh, there is going to be some degree of competition between everybody for, for jobs, right? So you will find yourself probably applying for the same job that a lot of your, uh, your fellow classmates um, have also applied for. So I saw a resume from a student that said this once. I am over 100 times more qualified than anyone else who will be applying for this job. And that that stuck out to me because I was like, wow, this is like this is really embellishment, but how do you how do you quantify that? Like I was on one hand I'm thinking like okay, this is just you know, some some silly resume, but on the other hand I'm thinking like part of me wants to go waste some time and uh, I can do what's called the pre-screen. So if there's something about a resume that I really want to know about, just one thing, I can ask our HR team, can you just pre-screen this one individual? I have one question, call them, let me know the answer. And I, I, I have sat there for a bit going, I should ask HR to pre-screen this and just ask them one question. How did you quantify that? Right? How did you decide 100 times? Why are you not 50 times or 30 times or 1,000 times, right? Just to, just to kind of see more, from more of a humorous perspective, what what would they say? But at the end of the day, you know that's um uh, uh there's a waste of everyone's time. But don't don't say things like this. So if you're sitting here and you're looking at you know your classmates beside you and you're kind of going yeah we're friends now but you know once we graduate we're all going to be competing for jobs. Don't don't put anybody down right. Don't say things like yeah I'm better than all my students or anything like that. Especially not a hundred times more qualified. Um, one of the things as well is oftentimes um, these are are very technical. Uh, resumes that I'm getting. So people, they're they're talking about their technical skill sets, right? They're not so much talking about um, their their people or their characteristic or their their emotional intelligence. They're talking about technical skill sets, which brings me to my next one. So so again, um, it's okay to to sell yourself. In fact, that's the point. But know that there is a line between you know just embellishment and and exaggeration versus the truth. And don't don't put others down, um, even if it's passively like this. Um, this is. This is a little more technical, um, but I do. This is probably one of the most common things that that I see, um, and I'll summarize it as: don't include a list of key technologies without including a short summary of how they were used. So um, I explicitly wanted to put one in there because we do see a lot of resumes from Concordia grads, um, you know, applying for security jobs on my team. And one thing that that I've noticed is. Um, a lot of resumes that I will see is they'll, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll list like just the specific technology that they use, but at a very high level and not um, elaborate on it. So to give you real examples, things like this, uh, I've seen resumes where they'll be like, I'm proficient with Kali Linux. I'm familiar with Windows Server. I have expertise in vulnerability scanning. So you might look at that and say, that's a totally normal thing. Yeah, like, why would you not put that on a resume? And and the answer is, is I'm not saying don't do this. Like, what I'm saying is, make sure you expand on this a little bit. Because when somebody says, I'm proficient with Kali Linux, to me, I know that to be an operating system. Like, Kali's an operating system. That's really what it is. Now, yes, it comes uh, prepackaged with a whole range of really fun hacker tools. Um, but when someone says, you know, I'm proficient with Kali Linux, what I'm gonna nitpick out of that is I'm gonna nitpick someone who knows, you know, who's claiming to know everything about Kali Linux and every tool and the ins and outs and all of them. 
And I know that, that maybe a small number of those tools might have been used in the past. Um, but when someone says I'm proficient with Kali Linux, what I'm really looking for is you know, um, highlight some of the tools in there that were used. So same with, same with Windows Server, right? Someone says I'm familiar with Windows Server. Like, cool. Again, it's an operating system. You know, we can have five Windows Server deployments, all with completely different services. Um, expertise in vulnerability scanning. I'll get to that one in a second. But I, I have examples. Right, so if you're going to write proficient with Kali Linux, don't just leave it at that. Add something, you know, list the specific tools within Kali uh, that you feel you're proficient with. So you can say things like Nmap, you know, Metasploit Framework, Burp Suite. I just, I just pick some. Um, bonus points for modules. Oftentimes, what I've seen is people will say, yeah, "I'm proficient with Metasploit Framework," and then in an interview, one of the things that will come out is. They've only ever used Metasploit once. They used it once for a lab where the target was designed to fail to one specific module. And the lab is just sort of step by step, walks them through it, uh, because the intent is to teach them what successful use of Metasploit looks like from this one module. Um, but then when uh, you, you say, OK, so here's the entire professional Metasploit framework. Here's a whole bunch of other systems. You know, go Go get a shell on something. Then sometimes someone kind of falls apart, and, and they're only used to that that one that one tool, so or that that one module. So if um, you have modules, or you you know there's specific modules that you've used, um, you know really when someone says I've used I've used Metasploit, what I'm really trying to figure out, or what I want to learn from them is cool. What were you targeting? Like what were you actually exploiting? Um, those are key key things to uh, to include in a resume. Um, familiar with Windows Server, same thing, right? You can just take a generic Windows Server. You can add all sorts of roles to it. It can be Active Directory, or it can be a domain controller. You can do the um, as a distributed file system. It can be IIS, a web server. Uh, so don't just say I'm familiar with Windows Server, right? Say I'm familiar with Windows Server and experience things like installing you know, and building Active Directory, um, whatever. I just, I just again, I pick these. But the point is, if you've um, if you have expertise in very specific components of these operating systems, throw those in there. And that last one, this one is this one is interesting. So we run a formal vulnerability management program um, at the university, uh, and that's a, a whole set of processes and procedures that are all about um, identifying, classifying, and mitigating the possibility of being attacked or harmed. That that's vulnerability management. So what I'll usually see is someone will say, "I have expertise in vulnerability management or expertise in vulnerability scanning," and I want to know less about the fact that someone ran a port scanner and more about the fact, you know, what did they do about it and how did they go resolving the issues? Um, this is, this is if there's anything in here that, that, that I can say that would probably, from a technical perspective, really make someone stand out, is most resumes that I get, someone will have Nmap on there, or they'll have uh, Nessus or something, right? Is there OpenVAS, right? They have experience running a port scanner, but they leave it at that. Um, I'm a very big proponent of the fact that a good vulnerability management program is actually uh, tool agnostic. So you could replace your, your Nessus environment with a, an Expose environment or an OpenVAS environment, and nothing would change from a process perspective. Your vulnerability management processes still stay the same. You've just you've changed your technical side. So for something like this, if someone's going to talk about, I have expertise in vulnerability scanning, great. But the real, the real way to stand out with that is to talk about your vulnerability management processes specifically, meaning how did you use the tools to identify those vulnerabilities? How did you use them to classify the different types of vulnerabilities? How did you prioritize that? And then how did you um, uh, remediate them? Um, and extra bonus points if you can tell me how you had to convince somebody else to go remediate, because that's in, in our environment, my team is responsible for those first two. Right. Our job is to, to do the identification of the classification, um, and then we prioritize. But then we have to go work with a large number of sysadmins uh, to actually go in and mitigate those vulnerabilities. And they often have a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of things going on, on at once. So again, don't just say expertise in vulnerability scanning, because what I heard is, cool, someone you know, ran Nmap and found some ports. You know, tell me about the vulnerability management processes that you, you followed uh, to run that scanner. Um, again, speaking about technology, the next one. This again, one of my favorites, um, because this happens. Uh, don't include every piece of technology you have ever used. Um, sometimes people will sit there, it feels, and they'll brainstorm. What is every piece of tech I have ever used going back 20 years? And they'll they'll itemize it in the resume. They'll put it as a bullet point, and they'll submit it. Um, my record is 13 pages 
of bullet form, bullet form itemized technology, everything they have ever touched in their life. This is actually like what it looked like. So Microsoft Office 2003, 2007, then the standard version, the professional version, the professional plus version, the Visio version. Oh, look, 2010 came out. Now we itemized 2010 and then 2013. And instead of just saying, you know, Microsoft operating systems, they had to let me know, you know, I'm, I've touched home, professional, professional, blah, 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 down, 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 13 pages of this. And the catch was barely any of it had any relevancy um, to the job like that we were hiring for. But what caught my eye was on the very last page, page 13, so I'm, you know, I, I actually managed to get to page 13, skimming it, was that line at the bottom. It said, managed large enterprise firewall deployment. And that was it, just one line. And I was really surprised by that because nowhere in the job application does it say anything, or in the, the job posting, does it say anything about Microsoft Office or Windows or anything? Uh, but we do talk quite a bit about like, like firewalls and network security. And for whatever reason, they chose to take all these different technologies, break them out into literally 13 pages worth, and then one line of enterprise firewall deployment. And, and what I wanted to see was like, like, why don't we flip that? Flip that. You know, again, don't give me 13 pages, but what if you try something like this, right? Summarize and keep it relevant to the role. So in that example I just used, um, expertise with all versions of Microsoft Office, just put it as a bullet point, right? Expertise with the Windows operating system, put it as a bullet point. If you want to put it in brackets, you know, XP to Windows 11 or something, fine. But for me specifically, that last bullet point was of key value, but there was no information there, right? So when somebody says, I have expertise with a large enterprise firewall deployments, that's what I want to hear about because that's literally on, on the job posting and that's a very key thing. So what I did is this is me sort of giving examples of expanding that. So large enterprise deployments from vendors such as Cisco, Fortinet, Palo Alto Networks, I just picked a few, right? That tells me that, oh, this person um, actually has some degree of experience with a large number of, of different firewall platforms. Um, tell me what operating systems you ran on them, right? Proficient with Cisco ASA, Cisco Firepower, 40 OS, Pan OS, whatever. Um, that that actually helps me out a lot as well. So I know I know in the um, the Concordia programs, I believe you guys have a firewall course. Um, I'm pretty, or at least you did, but I do see it on on some of the resumes. Like I took a firewall course. So for the student side, start telling me about that. Tell me a little bit more about it, right? Tell me about scope and scale. Um, for example, right, managed rule sets exceeding a thousand rules across fifteen firewalls at five branch offices. That's just that's just an example. But if if it's a lab environment or something, you can say, hey, I manage you know three or four firewalls with you know a couple dozen rule sets or something, um, because that actually tells me how much experience you know does the person have. Um, again, I'm not looking for someone that has like large internet service provider great experience. I just, there is a huge difference between, you know, someone who says, yeah, I, I used IP tables once to make a rule change versus someone having to actually manage everything that goes into an enterprise firewall deployment. Um, and then that last part, right, routinely patched firewall firmware on six month schedule following organization change management processes. So that's the other catch too, is that if you're gonna be responsible for a firewall, it's not just about the rules and the policies and what you're permitting, um, you're gonna to have to, to keep it patched. And in large enterprise environments, you can't just go in and you know, patch them because you're gonna cause some outages, you have to plan this stuff. So that's examples that I have of stuff that I would love to see, right? So when somebody submits me 13 pages of bullet point tech that they've ever touched and decides to take the, the firewall stuff and make it just one bullet point. No, do the opposite, right? Summarize the rest and expand on, on those key things that are relevant for, for the job that you're looking at. Um, speaking of which, 13 large page resumes. Um, got a few more of these. Don't make your cover letter look like a recipe website. So if you've, um, recipe websites drive me nuts. Uh, all I want is the recipe. Just get me the recipe. But where is the recipe? buried way at the bottom of the website because what do you have to do you got to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and you know the person's life story is always in there you know it's like all they want is a recipe for like chicken alfredo but you got to scroll how the person you know i don't know they they were down on their luck one one christmas eve and they just happened to be you know walking down the street and and the wind kicked up and then this recipe blew in front of them and it was you know some miracle and just skip all of that 
Um, we don't need to know life story. So I want to give everyone an example of, of something. This is one that I rewrote a little bit just because I didn't want someone to, to you know, copy and paste it. But this is it. I'll read it and they'll part of it. Uh, when I saw this posting, I literally could not sleep and have not slept in three days since reading it because I was super excited. I'm currently very tired writing this due to my lack of sleep, but I promise if I get this job, I won't let this get in my way of my performance. I am very honest and open and also very engaging with others. Okay, I'm kind of getting that part. This is due to my long-standing self-awareness and ability to convert ideas to solutions, which I have been doing for many years. My spouse can attest to all of this for the five years we have been married, which is no easy feat. I can't wait to start on a cybersecurity role, and I blah, 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 blah. Don't do this. Um, the interesting thing in here is there is actually a couple lines um, that are, are good and valuable, and here they are in green. Um, I'm very honest and open and also very engaging with others. This is due to my long-standing self-awareness and ability to convert ideas to solutions, which I have been doing for many years. Perfect. Leave it at that. All that, that preamble telling me how you can't sleep and whatnot, just, just cut it out, right? The other stuff about your spouse and whatnot, cut it out. Um, and it's, it's surprising. Uh, you know, this, this is a bit of a, maybe a, um, a more extreme example. Uh, but but it's it's worth bringing up, right? Is, is focus on those those personality qualities that you have, not necessarily you know all this other stuff going on in your life. Um, another one, don't say excellent attention to detail, and then include a plethora of spelling and grammatical mistakes. So, one of the most important things in cybersecurity is knowing how to communicate with people, whether that's communicating with like, like executives or technical directors or non-technical people, um, coworkers. The, the nature of cybersecurity is that it, it's a fascinating industry because it's, it touches like basically everything now. Um, you go to the store and you buy an internet, uh, you know, an IoT toaster. There's a security con component of that now. Um, you know, one of the things I've said in the past is that we don't. Gone are the days of going to the brick and buying a refrigerator. You don't do that anymore, right? What you're doing is, is you go to the brick, you're buying a computer. Now that computer has a giant refrigerator attached to it, but you've essentially bought a computer with an internet connection and and what have you. Um, so cybersecurity is is basically in everything now, and and in large enterprise, you'll find it a component of of all IT processes and. Um, it's even morphing into more and more business, uh, and I'd say like risk management, um, enterprise risk management portfolios, and then even IT. So when people usually say excellent attention to detail, what I've learned over the years is they're often referring to their ability to look at a technical product or solution and to not make mistakes when entering commands or or entering it or or configuring it, um, which is I would probably a given. You know, if someone's going to hire someone for a professional security role. That's, that's a bit of a given, um, but I pay a lot of attention to the spelling and grammatical mistakes because in a role on my team, given the nature of what we do, you will be expected to communicate with people. You will be expected to write stuff. You're going to have to document your knowledge. Um, you're going to have to write up um, incident reports. You're going to have to write business proposals. You're going to have to write all sorts of stuff. Um, so, so my current record is... Uh, about 150 mistakes in, in three pages, which I'll be honest, it's, it is quite large. Um, you know, I, ha I do have a degree of tolerance for certain things, but there's a couple tools. You know, it's easy to see when someone hasn't even put it into like Microsoft Word and, you know, the little blue and, and squigglies you get and the red squigglies, like at the very least do that. Um, ask someone else to, to proofread it as well. Uh, one of my favorite tools is called Grammarly. Um, I even don't even know how to describe how amazing Grammarly as a tool is. Um, I pay for it. I have a professional license. I use it every day in my job. Um, I use it for my academic stuff. I use it for my professional work, my career stuff. It's absolutely amazing. Um, one of the best things you can do is, is write up your resume or cover letter. You throw it into Grammarly, and it will spit out. It asks you some questions. You know, what, what are you doing? You know, what's the knowledge level of the audience? What's the intended audience? And it it can rewrite stuff so incredibly well that um, now I've learned that when, when I write stuff, I've actually had people commenting on it. It's like, hey, Michael, you write so well. Can you just, just you know, I wrote a draft, but can you just do whatever it is you do and, and make it look good? And I go, I'm not doing anything. I'm, I'm literally hitting copy and paste, hitting whatever the Grammarly button is, paying attention, and, and putting it back in the document. So, so again, proofread. Proofread the documents. Don't submit things with, with grammatical errors. And, and especially don't say, I have great attention to detail, because that shows me right then and there that, that maybe they don't. 
Speaking of paragraphs directly from websites, um, don't copy and paste entire paragraphs directly from websites. Um, I'm starting to see this now. So one of the common areas where I see this is if somebody has a gap in in their employment. So they haven't had, they didn't have a job for three years. You know, and that that can often cause a little bit of anxiety or stress when applying for jobs because you know you're going to be asked at some point or someone's going to be thinking it. You know what were you doing during those three years, right? Uh, and if you go to Google and you search, there are tons of websites out there uh, that can actually tell you um, how to answer that and how to write about that, that gap in a cover letter, how to address it in a resume, how to bring it up in, in an interview. But some of these sites actually will give examples. And they'll be like, you know, for example, if, if you were um, going to school, here's an example sentence that kind of uses the format we've described. Um, I've literally had multiple resumes in one, one hiring um, event copy and paste the exact same statement from the same website. Uh, I was reading you know, a cover letter, and, and, all, and, and all of a sudden I hit this. Right? I identified that I had a skills gap, so I took the decision to return to education in a bid to future-proof my career and upskill. Now that I've finished my course, I've been looking for a new position in which I can use these new skills. When I came across this position, I thought it could be a good fit and one I can bring real value and expertise to. And I was like, oh, wow, Like this is actually written really good. Um, it doesn't really fit the style of the you know what else has been written, but OK, cool, right? And honestly, I didn't really think anything of it. And then, ah, whatever, a few days goes by. You know, I read the resumes as they're coming in. Um, I get another another set of resumes, start reading through it, and boom, this exact statement again in another resume. And my immediate reaction was, hold on, didn't this person apply already? And I go go find that other resume. No, two completely different applications from completely different people, but with this this exact verbatim copied statement in it. Um, so the point is. Uh, don't don't just copy and paste stuff because it it is easy to see when some you know just it doesn't read very well all of a sudden it goes from you know maybe what I would expect to to suddenly a very well professional statement back to more of a, a technical resume um, rewrite these in your own words so if you are using these websites to to tell you here's how uh, you know here's how you can address say uh, an employment gap take the steps that they're using and write your own words don't just copy and paste. Um, their example statement and chuck it in the resume and and yeah because odds are we're gonna we're gonna notice that um, I think I only have a few uh, a few left here and then um yeah we're doing pretty good on time so one of the things that you hear a lot with resumes and cover letters and all that is you know um, uh, you know end it on a strong note right um, a very common thing that you'll see resumes end with are people saying something like you know I strongly believe you know my experiences in in cybersecurity and penetration testing and vulnerability management. You know makes me the ideal candidate for this job. But the point is, you know, there's that last statement. Right? You've done your pitch, and then it's you know I strongly believe that my experiences and skill sets make me the right person for this job. Now here's the catch. One of the biggest things, if you haven't haven't um, sort of pieced this together yet, what I'm really doing when I'm reading these applications and these resumes is is the most important thing I'm doing at a high level is I'm trying to figure out, does the individual even know what type of role they've applied for? And are they able to tell me through their cover letter and through their resume what, you know, what skill sets and experience they have that are directly relevant to the job at hand? Because the job is on the job posting, right? It's there, you're looking at it. It tells you, here's, the, here's your day-to-day -day tasks, here's your functions, here's what you're gonna do. Here's the technologies you interact with. And what I'm really looking for is can someone, you know, this this is the best advice I can give anybody is submit something that maps what what the job requirement outlines your job will be to the skill sets and stuff that you have that are relevant to that, right? So for example, if you're telling me um, you know, you you're fantastic at Active Directory, but nowhere on the job posting does it even say Active Directory. Yeah, maybe you can include it somewhere in there, but don't don't use that as an as an option to expand, right? Um, one of my favorites, and and so I use I use that line, that sort of that last generic summary statement. I use that as my measurement of how well does the individual know really what they're applying for. And I'll give you an example. This is an actual example of one that I've seen. I strongly believe my experience in customer service, motherboard installations, and printer repair. 
makes me the perfect candidate for the cybersecurity position. And you know, a bit of, a, of an extreme example, but um, this was this was somebody I believe who was coming from like like a tech support background at um, like like Geek Squad or Memory Express or something. And you know, yes, they were interested in cybersecurity, but I look at this and and I go. So customer service, you know, this is in the context of like, like retail customer service. But to me, you know, just be a decent human being. To me, that should that should be a given, right? One of the things we do look for when, when joining a security team is how well do you interact with people because you will be interacting with people. So for me, customer service is a given. Like you should you should have that. But things like motherboard installations and printer repair, um, if those are the things that they're deciding to highlight to convince me they think that that makes them the perfect candidate for the cybersecurity position now I'm, now I'm gonna start uh, I'm gonna start questioning things you know do they do they really not understand what the role is about was there nothing else that they, they could have put in there so again you know I strongly believe my experiences in in I don't know penetration testing end it end it with something that tells me okay you know what um, what it is that uh, you're applying for. So I was given 40 minutes. I think they said about 15 minutes for Q&A. So perfect. Um, so just to summarize, right? don't skip required documents. <laughs> if they're required, <laughs> submit them. Right, Regardless of what someone may have said about you know, those documents in general, if an organization requires them, please submit them. Um, don't use unclear wording when describing your expertise. Right, No Jedis or Messiahs or Mozarts. Right? Keep it professional and believable, right? We want to use words like like expertise, expert, you know, uh, proficient, things like that. Um, and again, don't exaggerate or embellish. Keep it factual because someone at some point is going to call you and they're going to say, "How did you quantify you are a hundred times <laughs> better than anyone around you?" Because that's just a silly thing to say. And I'm going to want to, yeah. Let's see what they say. Um, don't include any technology. Oh, don't include only technology names, right? Provide examples of their use. So if you're saying I've used, you know, again, Kali Linux, fantastic. To me, okay, they they for all I know, it means you logged into an operating system and you logged out and you said, Yeah, I use Kali Linux. Tell me what you use. Give us some examples of those, right? Um, don't include every piece of technology. Again, highlight and expand on what's relevant. It's okay to say, hey, listen. I've used all these technologies, great, but take the ones that are directly related to the job at hand and, and expand on those. Um, and then the last summary slide here, um, yeah, don't include life stories in the cover letter. Explain how your experiences are relevant to the role. Um, don't just say you have great attention to detail, right? Prove it by making sure the resume is polished. Again, proofread it. Heck, even open it in Word and just address all the little squigglies. Uh, Grammarly, fantastic tool. Um, oftentimes, um, I will say like English as a second language um, is something that, that I see quite regularly. So if you're not, um, uh, if you're not, let's say, confident that perhaps maybe it's gram grammatically correct, there are lots of resources, particularly at post secondaries, that will help you write your resume um, in a way that it will come off as polished. So, so seek out those resources. Don't just, don't just write something one afternoon on your own as a first draft and go perfect and hit submit. Run it, run it through some of these other services. Uh, again, don't copy and paste from the internet. Okay, rewrite it in your own words because there's a good chance someone's got the same situation you have, and they may have just found the same resource and copy and paste it as well. Um, also, from an academic perspective, the reason I also bring that up is because I'm not going to consider that plagiarism, but I do have general issues. You know, when even my own students are just copy and pasting various things. I spend a lot of time working with students. You know, this is there's a difference between, you know, usually what they'll say is, well, I really liked how it was written and I thought it was written well. And that that's okay, but you still I want to hear about it in your words. Right. It may be written good. Tell me it in your words. Right. And again, don't include generic summary statements just for the sake of including one. Right. Make sure the summary statement is relevant to that role at hand. So that's that's what I put together. Um, that's my my stuff of you know don't do this stuff. What not to put in on a resume? Um, I'll say thanks for the opportunity to present. Uh, I think we have about ten minutes left. So, um, Eslam, I'll pass it back to you. If there's any any questions from anybody, uh, anything really, you, you got my time now. Okay, thanks, Michael, so much for your interesting talk. It's really helpful to our students. And based on your experience, we would like to have you again in our in one of our uh, future InfoSec seminar to give us an, another interesting talk about uh, cybersecurity. Great. I'd, I'd love to Great. attend.
Yeah. Also, I'm willing to do one person. I, I did tell Sergey that he said this one's online, but just so you guys are aware, if you uh, I've I've talked to the the Concordia students multiple times in person, so you have a list. Yeah. Great. great. So time for questions. Yes, Prishan, please go ahead. Yeah, I guess it's good afternoon now. Do you have any thoughts on resume length? Uh, I keep hearing kind of two is ideal. Uh, don't go beyond four. Uh, I'm sure you've got a funny yeah. story about a, a 20 page one you can regale <laughs> us with. For me, I two to three is is ideal for me. Um, where where I'm willing to make an exception is if uh, the experience is is relevant to the job. So, for example, if if someone like so for me, um, I've been at the University of Alberta for 12 years and two primary roles six years as a technical security analyst and then six years in, in in a team lead role so something like that i could probably distill down to you know literally just one page but it's a summary of 12 years of experience whereas if um let's say someone's in a consulting role and you know they're they're doing a six month gig here a one year gig there uh what i what i would be more than tolerant with is that if it, if it takes them four or five pages to outline for you know a dozen years or ten years of, of professional work experience, uh, I'm okay. I'm okay with that. Where where I tend to draw the line is if it's like like a four or five page resume and only the last year is relevant and everything before that had no relevancy to the job, then then I would be like, no, what? Like we don't need all that. So I'd say keep it keep it to two, maybe three. But if it if you have a lot of experience in in that industry, it's it's okay to uh, it's okay to include all of that. Does that answer your Great. question? Uh, it does. Thanks very much, Michael. Great. And we have a question from our Associate Vice President Research. Carla, please go ahead. Hi, Michael. Nice to meet you. You as well. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, these InfoSec seminars are really completely outside of my area of expertise, but I always learn so much. What I particularly really enjoyed about your presentation is it's actually applicable to any field. And yeah. so, um, you know, I really wanted to thank you for that because many of the things you have found on resumes, I have seen as well in my experience. And you just, just wow, you are the Messiah. Like that word yeah. Messiah, like I just laughed. I'm like, how many times have I seen the word Messiah apply yeah. to a yeah. skill set? But listen, this was so, so well done. And I just thank you so much to you and also the folks who organized this, you know, for bringing you here. And I, like, I'd almost suggest to Eslam and uh, Sean, I believe you're the organizers of this seminar series to share this with career services. I think Michael, you, you just hit the nail on the head for so Great. many, Great. like this is just broadly applicable. So I just really wanted to say thank you so much. This was very, oh, great. very engaging. Well done. So let's face it, talking about resumes can be dull, but you made it well like, you yeah pardon me pardon me i was a little worried i was like much. like how many people are going to drop off this call as it keeps going you're talking about resumes but the, carla <laughs> thank, thank you very much what it what it does it actually your, your comments validate um a change in my presentation approach in the last couple of years um historically i would do a lot of presentations um like by security people for security people and i've learned in the last couple of years that uh, if i go to a security conference or i go to a security talk i'm surrounded by a lot of people who are in the same industry as me. And one thing that I've been paying more attention to, especially, I have three kids, they're, they're 10, eight, and seven. And especially as they get older, I'm starting to realize um, like how much cybersecurity can actually be applicable to a lot of industries and stuff that aren't cybersecurity. So a lot of the presentations I've been doing recently are not security conferences. They're not security anything, right? It's just, it's me finding ways to take my experiences from security and be able to speak about it in ways that would be applicable to um, to anybody. So uh, at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned uh, um, I bumped into Sergey at a recent conference, and bam, right? like that was that wasn't a cybersecurity conference. That was a conference all about uh, like is the internet broken? That was that was the theme there. And I did a presentation on on raising our kids uh, in, in in a connected world from again my own experiences as, as a father, as an instructor, as as a a teacher stuff, um, and taking the cybersecurity stuff, but removing a bit of the peer security and being able to open it up to a much larger audience. So uh, thank you, your, your feedback was was great. That's tells me that the, the, the process is, is, is working to some degree. So I'll, I'll keep doing that. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you. And we have a question from Obiula. Good afternoon, Michael. Um, thank you very much for a very insightful session. 
I have um, two questions. Firstly, you made mention of um, cover letter and resume. And I would like to ask if, um, should in case you're making, um, you're applying and um, there's actually no separate field to upload your cover letter. Is it um, advisable to merge the cover letter and the resume as one document? And also my second question is this, I'm an international student and of course, um, um, myself and majority of my class members are actually applying actively for summer internship, what to do. And um, of course, for some that have um, a prior experience in the field, uh, we found that on, on different um, job um, sites like LinkedIn, um, Indeed and, and the rest, um, that um, we have different uh, responsibilities and we find out that even as you apply, maybe some minutes after, of course, you are getting an email that, okay, fine, we are sorry, blah, blah, blah. We know that um, they're actually using some tools, maybe like AIs to remove some keywords. So what, what's your advice on this? Are we supposed to have several resumes for different job functions or job, descript de job descriptions? Or are we supposed to fashion a cover letter and rela as relates to the job description? So um, are we supposed to stare the cover letter? Are we supposed to stare the, the resume um, I know your resume must be in, in tune with the job description, but there are times that um, your job description would just be there and it will cover the, your real experience would cover your, the job description and other things you've actually done in the field. So are we supposed to remove everything else just to make sure that your, your forte is actually their job description or we are supposed to stare the cover letter in line with the job description? Thank you very yeah. much. No, great question. So, so for your very first question, the answer is yes. It's it's perfectly okay to merge them into like like one. Um, uh, no problem, Carla. It's it's perfectly okay to, to merge them into one document, right? So have start with your cover letter, and then you have your resume, just as one document. That's great. I think I did see a question in chat. You know, does the uh the, the page limit um account for the cover? I'd say no. So for me, like it's okay to have two three pages of resume, and then another page as as the cover letter. Um, for your other question, that's uh. That's that's a bit of a more complicated answer. Um, what I would say is, honestly, like, um, if I can rephrase your question a little bit, what what I often hear is somebody they say, you know, so what they really hear from me speaking is they say, Michael, you know, it sounds like you're expecting us to customize a resume and a cover letter just for you and your job at the university, and then they go but we don't have time to do that, right? We're applying for like a hundred jobs. I do not possibly have the time to write a hundred different cover letters and a hundred different resumes and all of that stuff, um, which, which I also understand. Now, how I'm gonna answer this, uh, again, your mileage may vary, but I'll give you a couple different answers. Number one, know the difference between a job and a career. Okay. Oftentimes, when someone wants a job, they're really they'll do anything. It's, it's just a transaction where I'm giving you my labor and you're giving me a paycheck. Um, a career is someone who is, you know, looking to start a job, but as a lifelong endeavor. For me specifically, I don't, I would say I hire into careers, not into jobs. Um, I don't necessarily run a team where people are like, hey, Mike, I'm looking for a cybersecurity job. What I prefer to hear is someone says, I, I want to start a career in cybersecurity. So one thing I don't have in, in this presentation, but I could put, put on there is, don't refer to your ambitions as a job, refer to them as a career, because that will tell someone, you know, who's reading your resume, oh, this is an individual who they're not just looking for, uh, uh, you know, a nine to five to, to, to pay the bills and get through life. They're looking for an actual career uh, in an industry that they're passionate about, um, that, that they can be invested in, and 20, 30 years down the road, they're still going to be involved in the industry. Um, but again, yeah, so so the neat thing about cybersecurity is it's such a hugely broadly massive field that um, I would say it's okay to have a, like a generalized security resume. It's okay. You know, if you're applying for a security operations job or a network security job, or you're applying for, um, I don't know what else, like, like a, a, a pen test job or, or an incident response job, like a general resume is, is okay to highlight your experiences and your skills, but still know the differences between those roles and and what particular experience you have that can highlight either one. Um, the last the last comment that that I would make would be like 
you know, I, I don't want to be a bad example, but like if someone is applying for a cybersecurity job and right now, um, I shall give a real world example, one, one of my students. So they, they got hired by Fortinet and one of the biggest challenges that they were having was the only hands-on practical experience was with Popeyes. Uh, they went to the university um, getting a master's, but the only experience they really had was, was, was cooking fried chicken. So what I actually told them was you don't don't just like you should put that on your resume because it does show you're employed, but highlight the stuff that you have to do that goes beyond just working at, you know, what someone will be like, oh, it's a fast food restaurant. You're gonna deal with customers, you're gonna deal with coworkers, you're gonna make mistakes, you're gonna learn stuff. Kind of maybe pull some of that out that, that highlights not so much maybe security stuff, but it does show some of the the personal learnings. Um, I don't know if, if I'm answering your questions at all here. But uh, that, that's kind of the, the stuff that's just coming to mind as I think about it. Yes, you did. Thank you very much. OK, great. Any more questions? Any more questions? OK, so thanks, Michael, so much again for your interesting talk. And thank you all for being with us today. We wish you all happy holidays and happy new year. And hope to see you all again in the next year in FOSEC seminars. Great. Thank you, everybody. Take care and happy Thank holidays. You, Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.